to develop resiliency, strength endurance day is key for me. So, you know, easy running over hills, um, been to a few conferences and there's loads of, uh, you know, key, key coaches that really, you know, highly recommend the, the strength endurance sort of stuff. So really, you know, going up, going up and down over mountains. That triathlon show, 163. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Paul Larson once again. I interviewed Paul in 2018 in a two-part interview in episodes 128 and 129 that I'll link to in the show notes and episode description. And now he's back to dive even deeper into high-intensity interval training and also talk us through some practical examples of how to include interval training in a triathlon training program. We'll also talk about the book Science and Application of High-Intensity Interval Training Solutions to the Programming Puzzle that is just a few days away from launch by the time you hear this episode. It's written by Paul and his colleague Martin Boucher. And Paul and Martin has put together a course on high-intensity high interval training as well to go along with the book, but to uh, take it even a step further for those that want to go as uh, deep and learn as much as possible. And we'll talk about that as well. Uh, I pre-ordered the book and uh, I'm eagerly awaiting my copy. And I hope that you'll want to do that too after listening to this uh, interview and uh, hearing how knowledgeable Paul li- really is. Before we get into the interview, welcome to a new sponsor, Retool. Retool Bike Fit makes your riding more enjoyable. Uh, it can make you more efficient on the bike and it reduces the chance of injury and increases comfort on the bike. Retool Bike Fit is uh, more than just a bike fit. It's a way that you can learn about your body and what the root causes of any aches and pains, pains you have may be and how a proper bike fit can help you achieve your your cycling and triathlon goals. I've personally had uh, retool bike fits on both of the bikes that I currently race on, and I am super happy with the results. A good bike fit takes into account comfort and power production and aerodynamics, and the bike fits that I've had, they hit all of these components and strike a perfect balance for me as an individual. And that's a really important thing. The retail system is so adaptable to the individual that that will be the case for you as well when you get your retool bike fit. And they are available at retailers all over the world. And to learn more about that and how to find your nearest retailer, go to www.retool.com forward slash TTS to learn more. And Retool is R-E-T-U-L. Okay, so let's get right into the interview with uh, Professor Paul Larson. So welcome back, Paul. Hey, thank you for having me, Mikhail. It's a great pleasure and uh, it's busy times for you as we just discussed with uh, the launch of uh, the Science and Application of High Intensity Interval Training book tomorrow and the course as well by uh, the time of this recording. So 19th of December, when the listeners hear this, it will already be out. So we'll have all the links in the show notes, of course, and we'll have the links to your previous episodes. So the topic of today's episode will simply be to to cover some things that we haven't covered in those previous episodes and the first thing i want to to ask about is uh, can you get into the cost in terms of fatigue recovery time and uh, injury risk and those sorts of things of uh, the various types of interval training yeah yeah it's a it's a it's a good and important question so you know and again reflect on the the i guess the interview that we did before to get you know to go over all the different types of intervals that we can have and, you know, I guess if we're going to take a hierarchy sort of approach um, on those different types and we listed, um, you know, we listed type one through five, well, it kind of goes down from five being the most extreme to uh, one being the most, uh, you know, least extreme. And so I, I guess, you know, taking the, you know, the all guns blazing ma- weapons of mass destruction approach as we we often says so sprint interval training would be the most damaging 
then repeated sprint training would be next. Um, you know, then, uh, you know, I guess to long intervals and then, um, so then, sh- you know, long and in- long intervals and then short intervals kind of would be the tamest ones. So, um, but that all that can, said, can you define can you define the, dura- the durations of these intervals just to remind people and and the recoveries between them? So roughly, what kind of workouts are we talking about here? Sure, sure, yeah. So when we were talking about the sprint interval training, those would be like um, you know these are like long sprints. So the you know, the intensity is all out, and it ranges from twenty seconds to thirty seconds in terms of the effort. The recoveries uh, would sit around, you know. Um, you're really trying to emphasize the anaerobic system. So you want to, you need to kind of calm the, um, the metabolic system down. So you need to have long recoveries between those. So generally between two and, f- and five minutes on the, on the recovery between those big all out efforts. And then, um, you know, your repeated sprint trade. So those are the big ones. And that's, you know, th- those are, um, there's a massive neuromuscular response and a big anaerobic glycolytic response to those things. So they, they can really throw you around. Uh, these are the ones that are doing the rounds in a lot of the, the mainstream, um, you know, media reports where people are doing a very short period of time. You know, you, you can get a lot of bang for buck by doing a very short uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, e- uh, exercise workout in your day, you know, workout for only five minutes of actual work. But you get the same the same benefits as, say, for an hour aerobic exercise. So those are the types of things that they're, they're talking about. So what you have to be very careful about is that, well, yes, you're getting a big response because you're getting a, it's a massive, you know, load on the whole body because the, of the all out nature of those short 20 to 30 second maximal sprints. So if you're incorporating those in, in, you know, in a, another sort of, um, you know, a big volume program, you can potentially run into, into some problems. Now, again, we're kind of coming down the next, the next one was the repeated sprint training. And those ones are shorter sprints. These aren't typically used in a um, so much in a in a, a triathlon context, but they are used often in a in a team sport context. And our our book isn't just about the endurance athlete; it's about you know there's 20 different sports where we're looking at the science and application. So yeah, the repeated sprint training are the, again they're still all out in nature, but they're shorter sprints, sitting around that three to ten second range, and then uh, the recovery is shorter as well, typically around uh, you know 20 seconds or thereabouts. And you're doing different various sets of these. Again, still a large um, anaerobic uh, and neuromuscular contribution, but a bit more typically a bit more of an oxidative um, response too, so aerobic response. And then, if we're looking at our longer intervals, I often like to these are often called you know VO two max intervals in the endurance athletes um, you know vernacular or coaches vernacular, and they would be like um, you know you know sitting somewhere around you know two you know. Um, maybe six by six by two minutes, and the, you know where you're developing a large, you know, heavy heavy breathing rate. Maybe you'd have you know one to two minute recovery in between those. Could be three, you know, f- uh, four by three minutes again, uh, or you know, um, with if you're going to use distances, could be you know, f- um, could be uh, six by a k. These these types of workouts and on and on it kind of goes. But these are longer intervals. And they're, um, they're stressing again, um, they can be hitting a type three, uh, three or four response. So either, uh, an, um, an, an anaerobic and, um, aerobic response in the type three or the type four response was the, um, you know, all, all, you know, all guns blazing, um, aerobic system, anaerobic system and the neuromuscular system. So those of you listening that, you know, do your VO2 max intervals, you know, if you, you can get a very good, good um you know hit out from those but you can also they also really throw you around and then finally the short intervals where these you know uh an example was uh you know like a 30 30 is is a classic um short interval set I mean, we might do you know uh seven sets of 330 uh, you know followed by a you know two to four minute uh recovery so when i'm saying 30 30 i mean like um 30 seconds of work and 30 seconds of easy and recovery. And this is typically at an intensity that's above that long interval that we just said. So above your VO2 max. Um, but because you're recovering within that 30 seconds, it's more sustainable for, you know, to do seven of them, for example, is, um, and then, you know, the, the key question that you ask, well, what's, what's the recovery or the cost of, of, um, 
of all of these. And it, it tends to relate to two key factors. One would be the, um, I guess, the hierarchy that I just described uh, going down, but also the individual. It's just, you know, um, certain individuals, if they're progressed to these, you know, these higher ones, well, they're more sustainable um, in contrast to someone that's just starting out and they're going to go and do the, the most extreme one. Well, they're going to need a whole lot more recovery. So, you know, it's, it's, and it's one of those, the answers is like, well, how long's a piece of string? And there's so many nuances and contexts that's, you know, in between everything to, to give a concrete answer. And that's really where the art of good coaching kind of comes in to appreciate, um, uh, you know, that individual recovery and how long that's going to take for, for a certain person. Right. But so then as a coach, if, uh, if we have somebody who is, uh, new to endurance sports or at least new to interval training maybe they have been just jogging and now we want to start them on interval training then it would perhaps make sense to start with those short intervals the the 30 30s in uh, split up in some sets somehow and then gradually you might introduce the the long intervals the two or three minute intervals and uh, and that's that's the hierarchy there because uh, they they are less uh, less taxing in in many different ways the the ones that we that you described last with the short intervals and then the long intervals compared to the sprint interval training and and the repeated sprint training for the team sport aspect yep you got it so that's exactly how i would progress them okay um, okay would start, and, and if i'm starting out i'm, I'm giving a show yeah, i'm probably starting out with a short interval and and not a lot of them too right i mean if someone's just starting this for the first time i'd I, you know maybe four 30 30s that's all you need um just to just to kind of feel that or you know even <laughs> You know, even two to just to just start. It really depends on the the person that is that is sitting in front of us. Um, yeah. You know, at, at the other at the other end, like you know, if we're, if we're talking Kyle, um, Kyle Buckingham, he would be, you know, I, I, it's even though he's just you know coming off his off season, I know that he could handle, you know, he could probably handle two sets of seven, no problem. So it's it really depends on the training age and and the specimen that's that's sitting in front of us. Yeah. Are there any differences in terms of uh, peripheral fatigue or injury risk, like how your muscle soreness in your legs, for example, and uh, and then the, the nervous system fatigue that we might have, things that we need to, to consider in that regard with the different types of intervals? Or is it just that the more extreme types, they are more extreme on all of these levels, the cost levels? No, I mean, you can get, um, I would say the, the neuromuscular response. So the neuromuscular musculoskeletal response tends to be a little bit more, um, vigorous or, uh, larger on the sprint interval, um, types, the, you know, the type five response we, we described and maybe not as bad on the central nervous system response. Um, and again, we're, we're, we're speaking to central nervous system response. I'm, I'm, I'm talking, I guess, I think we're both talking about almost that, you know, that central fatigue that you might feel um, yeah. versus versus a muscle soreness thing. Yeah. And but you mean like, you know, yeah, you can, VO2 max intervals, even you know, short intervals. You repeat short intervals enough, you can still, and you do them and do them uh, with high enough intensity, you can still get the same sort of uh, response. It's um, and that's one of the things that we we talk about in both the book and the course is that. Um, there's lots of ways to skin the cat with all of these different weapons, the uh, the formats, and uh, you can you can get really similar responses for, you know, uh, again a short interval, even relative to the, the the sprint interval, you could probably come up at, come up with a similar sort of um, you know central nervous system or musculoskeletal type um, type issue, and that's where you're monitoring um, and indivi- and and really listening to the individual is going to be so important as a coach. Yeah. How do factors like uh, your age uh, and training age and uh, gender and uh, experience uh, influence how you uh, select the the high intensity intervals uh, in addition to what we described with the with the beginners? So perhaps if we start with gender differences, are there any gender differences to consider? No, n- not I don't like so if I'm programming for uh, a female versus a male athlete, I'm not really considering the um, the gender per se, it just, you know, it's, it's completely, yeah, that's out of the picture for me. Um, I, I don't really see too much, too much differences. I mean, I'm aware of the different, you know, the slightly different metabolic, um, you know, responses that you might have where, um, 
you know, gals tend to be a little bit uh, better fat burners than, than guys, but that doesn't really alter my programming too much because, you know, as we can speak about later, I don't think that, uh, you know, the anaerobic training isn't really too much on the, on the triathletes diet. It's, it's yeah. more the, the, the aerobic type intervals that you're, they're doing anyways. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, I, I don't really alter my, my programming for gender um, at all. And if you want to go to age, you know, that's uh, that really comes down to training age. Um, you know, so I'm, you know, I'm sadly pr- approaching um, about 50 now or getting closer, closer to 50. And, and I don't program, you know, I'm not going to program my own training um, too much different than when I was a 20 or 30 year old. It's, I'm still going to use the same sort of philosophies and uh, I still think I'm going to respond sort of, you know, somewhat similar. I'm just not going to be able to produce the same output that I did when I was, when I was a young buck. That's all. Mm, yeah. But that, that's good to hear. And that's also something that, that I see in that uh, a lot of the, the athletes that are around 50 or even above 50 can, can do quite a lot. And it, there's no, no rule that, that we can simply say that all right after 50, you need to, you need to start to do, do much less and uh and uh, that's just the way it is it, it really depends on the on the individual and the same thing some young athletes they they can't do handle too much i, I would put myself in that bucket so that i i can't do too much hard work i'm very much a diesel engine that that needs a lot of volume but but not too much of the high intensity stuff yeah yeah so yeah there you go come it really comes down to the individual with all these different things and i don't think we can make black and white uh decisions across you know gender age etc um, but experience, you know, when you have experience as a coach, you start to recognize quite quickly what's in front of you. And, you know, after you get getting a little bit of a history and then you can start to make some of these calls, but you quickly have to alter your plan, obviously, once you're, once you're, um, applying that program and testing, and then you get that response and you, you, you need to adjust your program accordingly, you know, the, whether someone is, you know, handling these intervals well or, or not. You know, and and then you you quickly should need to kind of adjust the adjust your progression um, slope accordingly. So, what's your take there uh, regarding that on working on strengths versus weaknesses? Like, if somebody is really good at one type of interval, should they aim to strengthen that and they really enjoy and seem to thrive on them? Is that something that you should then focus on, or conversely, should you actually then start to do a type of intervals that they might not do so well at? Well, really, I need, again, I need to know the context. I mean, are we specifically talking about a triathlete here? Yeah, um, or yeah let's, let's talk about a triathlete. So sure. I'm- so in a, tra- in a triathlete, again, I'm going to do a performance analysis on, uh, you know, on that athlete's uh, event. So what is, you know, what's the performance that we're kind of after? And, you know, how, how, how close to the pointy end are we? And then what, you know, how far off? Uh, are we at hitting those those benchmarks for, for swim bike run and um and then you know within that what what are the what are the pinch points you know so to speak right like you know is it you know if if we're talking about an elite is it you know they're they can't hit the um you know the 300 meter uh, boy and you know we really need to work on their sprinting output for um uh you know for swimming um same sort of thing for cycling like are we yeah, are we unable to do the um, the high end work, and we getting dropped on some of the hills. And um, you know, likewise with the run, you know, is is speed is you know is absolute speed probably the the key the key factor. And then yeah, we shape the we shape the the intervals uh, you know kind of accordingly to to that. Yeah. So yeah, for performance analysis always first, and not hit analysis so so to speak. Although you can almost kind of you should be able to predict if you're monitoring well with a power meter, a, a, a you know, a, a GPS um, and these sorts of things and getting some times in the pool, you, you, you get a pretty, it shouldn't be any, you know, surprise on race day. If um, in terms of what you're actually getting from, for a, for a performance, the, the two are, the two kind of go hand in hand, even though we always, we're always dreaming the performance is going to somehow be a little bit better, but it never, it never really is. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering for, for an elite athlete like that, if they are like genetically, let's say that they are very strong on the shorter stuff, should you try to do quite a lot of that? Because some of it might trans- translate very well into aerobic adaptations. Uh, again, if you decide the intervals as such, as you talked about, uh, or should you try to 
strengthen their their aerobic side by doing the more aerobic intervals like the the long or the short intervals mm-hmm. yeah i guess i see what you're getting at. and and again we're kind of um so this is you're almost speaking about the anaerobic speed reserve and that's the anaerobic uh the almost the inherent uh anaerobic ability of of someone that you might get and again we we have to look to the sport it's an aerobic sport and it's you know endurance matters so i i would uh i mean anaerobic intervals even if you're good at them and you're you know, if you're desiring to be a triathlete well you probably need to um yeah, I would slant mostly away from that. I mean, you've got to have some level of a base. You, if you, you know, if you're enjoying them, uh, there's no reason why a short interval sequence repeated enough can't be highly beneficial. Uh, so, you know, it it would be. I, although, you know, I just don't see that a lot, right? Like, if a, if an elite triathlete's kind of coming to me, they they have to love the longer and the endurance sort of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, otherwise they're, they're kind of in the wrong sport. Um, so yeah, I mean, they're all the, all the programs have some sort of general, um, you know, commonality, although I'm kind of reflecting now again on a triathlete, a, one of the elite that I used to coach and yeah, he was, he was, he did love the anaerobic sort of stuff a little bit better. So yeah, lots of there's loads of different people out there with with different uh, strengths and weaknesses. You, um, you know, and and again, we're the extremes. We're talking of you know 18 hour a week um, training weeks on the anaerobic type athlete versus a 30 plus um, you know training hour week um, for a uh, you know uh, and these are you know pointy end type um, type volumes uh, you know, in the peak sort of build up phase. And yeah, I mean, you can see swings as lo- as large as that. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes you need to probably listen to the athlete and, and, um, give them a little bit of what they, what, you know, what they, what they like. And, uh, I, I've, um, I guess I'm seeing in, in, uh, in my experience, I'm seeing, uh, success with both of those different models. So yeah, I'm not sure if I answered your question there, but. Uh, yeah you did you did we 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 got we got to it i i think that's a a fascinating topic to discuss because it's uh again it might be a bit different on the on the age group side of things especially with well anaerobic capacity is never a limiter on the age group side of things really if we're realistic so so then then it might be slightly different but but still it's it's i think it's interesting to uh, to go through these scenarios because it it can help you sort of get to the thought processes behind how you should be thinking about training, even in other aspects like work on strengths and or weaknesses in in various capacities. You always need to enjoy it at the end of the day, right? So so in in a way, like a little bit of of what the athlete enjoys, if that is their strength, even if it's not a limiter, uh, is probably useful to include. Yeah, you know, definitely, definitely. And again, this you know you can. A uh, little bit of a, you know, if you if you want to dig deeper as a, as a listener, you can go into the Plus and Prof, um, uh, you know, website and blog. We I blogged about this, uh, my experience with this athlete. So, and and, and you know, he was, uh, yeah, he definitely he knew what he needed to get um, to be successful, and he was coached by a number of other excellent coaches out there, big with big names and stuff in the world. And they, we, you know, I think we all came at him with a um, a certain philosophy with respect to the fact that we needed to have, uh, you know, a big, large kind of uh, volume of training behind, uh, behind our, behind the athlete. And the guy proved us wrong. I mean, he, so um, power to him for knowing what he needed. And uh, again, we, as we, as coaches and scientists need to, uh, need to listen to, to um to our athletes um because you know sometimes yeah sometimes that intuitive little man that speaks to us or a woman that speaks to us knows better yeah uh so let's talk about how to include uh interval training over the course of a season and uh, let's start with if you can uh, talk us through an example for training for short distance triathlon and this time let's uh, not talk about the elite and as much as as the age group end of stuff but somebody focusing on sprints and olympics yeah. Well, 
again, if we're, if we're talking about um, an age group athlete, again, there's, there's such a range in age group athletes, right? Like I can, we could talk about my guy, uh, my, uh, my mate, Dan Blues, who I, you know, I coach with. Um, and he's obviously like an he's elite. He's disqualified because he's a long distance guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. But that's the range you can have, right? Or you no. can have someone that's just trying to finish their very first sprint distance triathlon and just finishing them. Finishing is the, uh, is the utmost goal. So there's a, there's a big field between the whole thing. So that's why, I, you know, that, I guess that's why I'm more, uh, I'm more comfortable with the elites. And, um, but, and, and again, if we are, so we'll start with a person that just wants to finish this, uh, this short distance triathlon. Well, you know, it's, uh, and, and maybe they're time crunched and they don't have, um, and don't, don't have the ability to perform too many long hours. Well, um, you know, I guess in that context, if they're training less than 10 hours a week, then yeah, a, a good set of uh, regular intervals is, is going to be beneficial. Now they're not going to have to worry uh, um, directly about, you know, short intervals versus long intervals. Anything usually is going to be pretty, pretty beneficial. Uh, I think a, you know, 30, 30 set is going to be probably just as beneficial as a, you know, two minutes on two minutes off uh, longer VO2 type intervals. Um, just doing the work is, is probably going to be the, um, the key benefit, um, because you're not, but, you know, I guess once we, we transition sort of into that 15 to 20 hour, uh, type triathlete where, you know, almost the polarized, um, training starts to be of more benefit, then, um, you know, that's when we might want to sort of start to focus a little bit more on shorter intervals versus and higher powers versus the longer ones say for example um yeah I, and, and again so shorter intervals for the shorter distance longer intervals for the longer distance um so yeah that's you want, I don't would, know you, want to... would a week for example include one session per week in each discipline of uh, of those types of intervals or or yeah. would you have more in for example swimming or or how would you structure a typical week yeah so that's a again a very specific to the individual but let's just throw some some principles out there i do like to have at least one high intensity workout per week uh in each discipline and the again the better the athlete gets and the more towards their um the pointy end of the season they get, the more I'm going to add in some of, uh, you know, the increase, the frequency of those high intensity sessions with variety as well. Right. So you might go from, uh, you might have a, uh, a short interval on one day and, uh, after some recovery, another, you know, a long interval on the, on the next, uh, if you're adding to those, but absolutely. Yeah. Starting with just one in, in, um, one in each discipline sort of per week would be a good place to sort of start. And uh, I would also, again, to your other question, I would have more in swimming. So um, versus, and then the the next hierarchy there is the the cycling. And the last one, the, the one that's the most strenuous is the running. So, um, and, and that's the, because it has the largest um, neuromuscular strain involved with the eccentric, um, eccentric component of running. It's going to create lots of muscle damage. And you know, you know yourself, the listener when you're out there you know running uh, running tends to unless you've you know, unless you've grown up uh, as a runner um you, you know running is the one that tends to have the largest um the largest musculoskeletal strain in the in the subsequent days that you know the doms that you get a couple days after so you're going to have the you're going to need the longest recovery and, and you want to you don't want to probably do, be doing too many of those ones too soon um yeah so i think I don't know if you want to pry anything more there, Mikhail. But. Yeah, uh, well, are there any other considerations specific to the different disciplines uh, other than the hierarchy of how much you should be be doing, for example, in terms of selection of the types of, of intervals, or or is it, uh, or, or or is that mostly it really knowing how much you can add in the different disciplines? Yeah, well, I mean, we can we can kind of go through each discipline one by one, but uh, you know, starting with the swim, you know, I. I like to be, I like to have different focuses on, on the swim every week, um, depending on the, on the individual. But again, like, you know, key, like I, my context is so often the elite. So I'll tell you what I like in the elite. I like, um, you know, I like a strength focus set where there's, um, 
pull paddles and bands, and those can be done in a, in a hit sort of format. Another day, I really like an emphasis on speed. So this would be, you know, um, almost the the sprints or the the sprint interval training type type stuff. So um, I make Dan please and I love love to um, love to do speed sets, and um, we call these ones Gomez because uh, you know Gomez is is uh, is very famous for his uh, his ability to, to sort of sprint in swimming. And um, yeah, that's like a that's that's really I guess the key hit day. So I definitely like to have one of you know, one of those sorts of days, and those could be twenty fives or fifties with longer sort of recoveries between. Um, and then another day, I, you know, I think uh, in triathlon, um, we need to have sort of a threshold set. I mean, it's a very you know, if you're talking Olymp- whether it's Olympic distance versus versus long distance triathlete, um, you need to have that sort of sustained threshold. Your critical power, critical speed needs to be up there. So long, long intervals, pieces like four um, hundreds, and again, that isn't kind of because it's a threshold set. It's not um, technically classified as hit training, but it, you know, y- you'll you'll feel it, sort of thing. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, the other days, uh, recovery techniques. Swimming is just so technique, so technical. And then in the, you know, we have to compete in as a triathlete um, out in the open water. So it's if you can, if you're privileged to live in a place where there's good open water facility and, you know, an open water session is, is the other is sort of the fifth, fifth key day in there. So I like to have those sort of key, key, um, key five days. And then, you know, if you're going down that's sort of at the pointy end of, um, our, our elite. And I, and then I guess, you know, if you're taking, taking pieces off or taking some sets off on there, you'd probably take the open water off first. And, um, you know, we, I think most people can sort of swim four days a week, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you could take a recovery session or a technique session off and just add that into one of the other days. Mm. But yeah, those are, those are the main the main sort of workouts that I like to have within a swim week myself. Um, and uh, if we go to the cycling, yeah, on the cycling. Well, again, we'll, we'll start with the elite level and the key days. I like to have. I like to have a. Um, I really think a, a strength endurance, a low cadence sort of you know hill day is 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 vital to have in the program. You know, and these might be sort of more prolonged sort of. Um, you know, hill repetitions, uh, you know, ranging from five to, to up to, you know, up to 20 minutes for, you know, just really grinding away the, the longer, more suited, of course, to the, um, the iron distance, uh, triathlete versus the, 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 the shorter ones for the, uh, towards the sprint distance. And then, uh, d- you know, definitely a, a short interval session, um, and then progressing to long intervals. So we, we went through those ones just, uh, just previously, um, and then, uh, you know, a good threshold day it might be a crit race for, a for an Olympic or sprint, but it might be, uh, you know, um, it might be like more long to mid zone work for an Ironman or 70.3 athlete, like, you know, four by 20 or 30 minutes at uh, 70.3 or our Ironman sort of pace. Again, acknowledging these aren't, uh, aren't intervals per se. They're more mid zone sort of intervals, but that's, I know that's very important and, um, when I look to the cycling chapter as well, uh, the, you know, the cy- cyclists, Tour de France cyclists and, and others do the same sort of, um, lot of, lot of mid zone sort of work. So it's important in the, the longer sort of we go. I, I, th- I think I think it's very important that uh, that it uh, comes through here that you even though you you wrote the book on on hit you use that uh, those mid zone sessions especially because I think polarized training is something that, uh, that is a bit of a buzzword right now to be honest so so mm-hmm. I get a lot of questions from the listeners about whether to to do these things in the mid zones at all or if you should just skip that completely and, and only do high intensity so so it's great to get uh, get your take on this as somebody who who of course. Uh, is very knowledgeable about hit, but but it's not exclusively hit that is going to ne- give you what you need as a triathlete. Yeah, I think we spoke on this briefly in the last the last uh, last episode that we did, and and there's a good blog that um, Dan has r- written on the topic in the Plus and Prof website. So check that one out. And it's really, I think it's the permedial um, versus uh, per, um, polarized uh, profiles, and the permedial. Uh, profile is more your Ironman uh, triathlete slash Tour de France type um, distance athlete, where they do a lot of the a lot more of the mid zone work. And then the more you're kind of getting to that, needing that high end, well, then that's you're starting to look that more more polarized. So your sprint Olympic a- athlete probably be a little bit more polarized, but your Iron and seventy point three athlete would tend to be a little bit more mid zoney and uh, primedial. But again, these are just 
these are observations and there's loads of ways to skin the cat as, as we say. And, um, but yeah, no, uh, um, the longer you go, I think the more you, the more the, the mid zone stuff is probably pretty important. Yeah. Uh, but uh, on that topic, before we go on to running, uh, I had forgot that, but it's a, it's a good point to, to bring this up because the sprint elite athletes, they will still be doing the Olympic distance races as well, where you will be on the bike, for example, if you talk about the bike for, for at least 50 minutes, uh, depending on the course. So, so it's still like at your, at your threshold, basically that you're, that you're racing it. So, uh, yeah, it makes sense that it's, uh, it's more polarized, but, uh, but how polarized can it be? You, you still need to, uh, to bring up that threshold, don't you? So, so what's your take on that? Yeah. Well, it, the threshold will go up if even in the polarized kind of concept, like the, you're still hitting the targets of, um, you know, what's going to raise a, uh, an anaerobic threshold or a critical velocity or power. So you're, you're still hitting your, you know, the skeletal muscle cells and the, you know, the, the cardiac output that matter that's going to enhance that. So, you know, it's not really, even though you don't, you're not specifically hitting, um, a, you know, a threshold pace per se, you're still, it's still going to raise. And I've done a loads of, loads of studies that are where I've observed this, right? So I've done interval studies and threshold goes up, even though they're not specifically training at that threshold. But it just that's that's the consequence of yeah training, yeah right yeah I express myself a bit a bit poorly uh, physiologically of, of course it happens I, I'm just thinking that uh, it might be difficult I, I'm just imagining if if I were to skip that training completely and then try to go and race an Olympic it, uh, it might, I imagine that it would feel very difficult to then go at threshold pace and and to hold that sustained hard although that's not exactly what they're doing at the elite end uh, to be fair but. Uh, but but still, would, would you say how, how, I'm just getting at how polarized is it? Is it completely polarized that you avoid that mid zone altogether? Uh, for many elite athletes, again, we cannot really generalize, but uh, or or do they still include that sort of training at the elite and training for sprint and Olympic distance races? But it's just a bit less than you would when you're training for seven point three or full distance races. Yeah, well, the key the key session that you're going to have in the Olympic or sprint triathlete as opposed to the um to the 70.3 and and uh an iron guy is 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 like a crit is a crit race if you can so we always try to get um the olympic or sprint athlete racing criteriums so you know hanging out with cyclists basically and and getting them into those types of races because they'll they'll be sitting in those uh, of a similar sort of distance they'll be sitting in their 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 heart rate is going to be sitting in that threshold kind of zone but they are it's very stochastic in nature right like it's with all the surges and and tactics and stuff involved but again that's yeah. that's the specifics for that that athlete kind of needs so um yeah again yeah that's that's and you, you still might have like a you know 20 minute sort of sessions right or 20 minute efforts mid zone but it wouldn't be maybe as um yeah, I, it's not my biggest. It's not my biggest focus for me personally as a coach, and what I've I've kind of seen. You, 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 yeah, you might have one of those sessions in there, but the the crit the crit racing and the tactics and and just what you get from um, for an elite race is uh, is 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 actually you know right in a crit race. So playing yeah playing so to speak if in there. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that makes sense because, I mean, even when you're recovering or you know, comparatively recovering in that crit race, you're not really recovering the way that you would do in an, in an interval session. You are still going hard, but just not quite as hard as in those, mm -hmm. uh, in those short and sharp bursts. So, yeah, uh, so yeah that, that sounds, it makes sense. But again, there's loads of ways to skin it too, right? Like, so hovering those threshold, you know, hovering around the threshold kind of things are, uh, are really fun too. And, and is going again, so many ways to skin the cat, but imagine if your threshold is, uh, you know, 200 Watts and, um, you know, you could do, you know, um, you know, you could do a minute, minute at 240, and you could do a minute at, uh, uh sorry, what did I say? 200. Yeah. So a minute at 220 and a, you know, a minute at 180 and, and kind of hovering around that. So that's a great set. And you could do that for, you know, for five minutes and then take a, take a five minute break and then do it for another five minutes. So many ways yeah. to skin it, but that's, um, it really just kind of depends on the, the level that you're, that you're at and what you're, what you're gunning for. Yeah. So if we take it to the run then, and, uh, the same way that you broke it down for the swim and the cycling. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, again, I'll just yeah, give you my sort of my key set. So uh, I, I think uh, that working you now, we mentioned the neuromuscular issue with running. So this is to combat that you want to probably develop, um, uh, you know, the neuromuscular system and to do that, to, to develop resiliency, strength, endurance day is key for me. So, you know, easy running over Hills, um, been to a few conferences and there's loads of, uh, you know, key, key coaches that really, you know, highly recommend the, the strength endurance sort of stuff. So really you know, going up, going up and down over mountains and, um, yeah, key run day is, is probably similar to cycling where probably progressing from short to long. Or I like those. So 30, 30, thirties to, um, you know, up to one K's and then up to even longer. If we're talking 70.3 and iron guys up to two K two K efforts. So moving to more towards the higher end, um, or sort of higher intensity and more to more towards the mid zone as we work out from shorter to longer, at least for, for myself got to have the long run in there so that's like that's going to be a key day too and i think that just that just develops endurance and and again the the resiliency within the musculoskeletal system and um and that's probably kind of across those are your key sort of days probably need a strength endurance day maybe a you know tempo day long run and uh and and an interval day would maybe be your key key four and then moving back to that if on the lower you know less trained individual and then you know adding adding one to the um uh, to the other, to the, you know, the very well-trained plus little bits of recovery, recovery runs when they're doing, you know, uh, some, some athletes doing two days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on that long run, it's not hit specific, of course, but, uh, this is uh, another interesting topic. How long would you say, and in this example, let's uh, consider the, uh, an intermediate age grouper that, uh, is experienced in triathlon, but they might be training 10 hours per week, let's say. Uh, how, how long do you like the long run to be for a short course athlete and, and then for like a long course athlete in, if you give a, basically the, the thought process there? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I think the long run is, yeah, I mean, everyone's got their bias, right? But I really like it. And um, it's, because you know, at least for me personally, it's very meditative and just nice, nice to be out in the forest or wherever you're, where, where you're happy, kind of thing. And um, yeah, I think you know, uh, probably for the sh- um, short course athlete, at least up to to ninety minutes uh, would would be nice. Um, you know, if they're they're trying to they're aiming for a uh, for a ten k race, but of course that you'd, you'd start back. Um, you, you know, you'd start back at uh, at thirty minutes, right? but you'd progress that, I guess, over to up to 90 minutes. And then if they're, um, it's actually not too, too much different for, um, uh, for a long distance triathlete. And it might, might go up to two hours, 20 for a, for a long distance triathlete, uh, Ironman, but it's, um, it's the frequency. So I, I've done that different. I think I, where I used to start, I used to start by really almost, you know, running the length of the marathon or even longer, which could take me, you know, my long run could be up to, you know, three and a half hours or, f- or four hours as a, as an Ironman triathlete. But I've really, again, through my meetings with lots of, um, uh, coaches that have done it different, really pulled that back. So, but, but still adding the frequency, uh, um, of the training, you know, few more, like more shorter ones along the road so that you're not having this huge, massive whopping, um, long run stimulus and you can hardly do anything the, the day after. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's that and just adding, still having high volume, but having it at a more, uh, a better sort of frequent um, stimulus. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, uh, what about the time that we need uh, from between heat uh, heat sessions in, uh, and uh, considering here that we might have more than enough time to recover between from one high intensity run to the next, but uh, when we are triathletes and uh, we already in these example programs see that there are quite a uh, a few key quality sessions going in in these programs how how do you think about reco- recovery between sessions here any special things to to consider mm-hmm. yeah it's super individual unfortunately i know i've used that throughout so apologies but that's the reality of it it's um it really you know training age is a huge one so how long have you sort of trained for these these types of events and um the, yeah you'll that that will determine a lot of your how resilient you are to to your stressor um, so the the more resilient you are, and the less um, soreness that you're feeling, that's that's probably one of the key 
the key indicators. Um, at, you know, in general, if you want to, I mean, if you just want to kind of consider the loading in your week, you would, um, you know, you can imagine that probably your your long run, you might um, you might be pretty fatigued after that one. Uh, and also, you know, I, I'll back up um, and just also introduce the. Um, the central nervous system response too. And remember, I think we spoke in the last one a little bit about HRV. And I, th- I think you've had Marco Altini on your on your podcast as well before. And um, yeah. and then Plus has talked about HRV as there, well. There you go. So um, for sure. So that's this is how you're, how you're it's a, a great little tool once you get your head around it for assessing that, um, you know, a marker of your um, your central nervous system fatigue. So I think, but the the two are the, the two are linked, but they're they're separate. So knowing your musculoskeletal uh, neuromuscular strain from almost from soreness, relative um, relative to your um, you know how fatigued and um, you know tired that you're feeling, and that's almost um, through more through HRV that'll pick that up because it's remember HRV is is a marker of your cardiac art, autonomic nervous system, and it's it's getting insight into you know, the brain and spinal cord and it's, it's overall interpretation or assessment of the lay of the land in your body, so to speak. Um, so yeah, get, again, getting, getting wellness, uh, scores, soreness scores, um, HRV can be great uh, and common sense at the end of the day, right? Like, um, to, to know what's, what's right for you as an individual too much too soon is going to run you into, into problems. The key is, is consistency and progression. So those, you know, you keep those, those in, in, in mind for you. What's going to, what's the session I'm going to be able to do today that's going to allow me to, you know, it's going to create a, a good stress, but it's also going to allow me to back that up and do something again tomorrow. Um, well, that's going to be a good recipe for getting to where you want to go. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so, and speaking of that, the the freshness and, uh, I mean, we, we're not always going to feel race fresh but uh how do do we want to try to feel more or less fresh when we do these especially the the hit sessions or is it okay to sometimes go into them and feel quite fatigued what i like to do personally and what i have been advising my uh my coaching clients to do is to always try to do the first interval do the warm-up do the first interval and see if you start to feel better uh but uh then and then you basically make a judgment call. Are you relatively okay to do the intros? Then then you just do them. And of course, you don't need to hit personal bests every single session. You you just get the stimulus in, hit the right sort of intensity, and then that's that's the perfect perfect outcome for the day. But uh, there is a point, I guess, when when we're just too too tired for it to be any beneficial do you have how how do you advise the listeners to think about when they might be too tired to actually do a session and are better off skipping it i don't think i could describe it any better than you just did that's exactly what um what we see so um and so you need to have a little bit of a motivated individual that's going to at least get in there and um and give the session a try just like you described and um you know do your warm-up do your do your first. I would even say the first set if you can. Like if it's not too extensive, do the first set. And the number of times uh, that I've read, you know, training week's comments for, from guys saying, "Oh man, I just didn't know if I was going to be able to get up for today." But as soon as I'd finished the the first set, gosh, I felt great. And uh, yeah, and then they're setting personal best for the for the next one. So yeah, it just um, you, you hit it like that. And that is. That's one of the key um, key aspects to uh, progressing the stimulus too, right? Because now you've gone in and um, yeah, you've given those cells another stimulus that they that they want that they need for um, for advancing to the sort of the next stage. And that's that's how you make good gains, in my experience, is when you when you get through those sessions and you figure that exact thing out that um, sounds like your athletes have figured out as well. Yeah. Uh, so final question before we talk a little bit more about your book and your course, how do you like prescribing intensities? Uh, do you use uh, RPE, power, pace, heart rate? Uh, what are your thoughts around these measures of intensity? Yeah, it's really important um, because we see so much of a, you know, I think a different philosophy from different coaches around uh, and, you know, some are prescribing specific powers 
uh, and you know, and maybe some would be prescribing specific paces or heart rates. Um, I like to be using, I don't know, you almost like um, prescribe the target of the sessions, call it something that the athlete understands, um, you know, that, you know, whether, you know, after a discussion with them, you know, might be VO2 intervals, we should know what VO2 intervals feel like after you're, after doing them a bit. Uh, same with short intervals, same with your threshold and mid zone, strength, endurance, et cetera. So, you know, go through an educational process and, and know what those mean. But then, and, and, and like you said, describe how it feels. Like you might write, you know, a, a strength endurance session at low cadence. It should feel heavy, for example. Um, but then, and then you're also going to give your reference targets, which you as a coach might adjust based on how the athlete goes. But, you know, you put in your, um, put in the reference power outputs that you think the athlete's going to be at or, uh, or adjust those according to, according to prior sessions, um, same with pace and, and, and same with heart rate too. So, um, you know, what's, what should the heart rate be for that, that, that sort of session? Um, so yeah, I, I think I use, I, I guess, a combination of all those different things. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, so, uh, the book and, uh, the course, uh, feel free to take it from here and, and tell us more about where we can find it and, and what we'll, uh, what we'll get when we, when we buy them. Yeah. Um, so thanks. Uh, check out hitscience.com if you are interested in anything further about high intensity interval training. So, uh, again, take off my hat to, um, my colleague, Martin Bichette and, uh, from France. And we've, we've got a, you know, a long 10 year plus history as researchers and scientists and coaches. So he's, um, he's, a uh, uh, he works for, a uh, a high level, f- uh, football club in, in Europe. And, um, yeah, we've written this, I guess it's all based on a, a literature review that we wrote in, in, uh, 2013. It was a big hit, pardon the pun and, uh, human kinetics, the publisher kind of came and, um, asked us to write the book on it, which we did. So the book is now available, um, uh, on the human kinetics website or, or through hit, hitscience.com. And then we said, you know, when we were building this, uh, this book, we, we said, you know, it's, it's great to have a book, but you can only learn so much from a book. Sometimes we all learn different mean, uh, different mediums, um, you know, audio such as you'll understand by listening to this, but also visual too. So we, we, we created a, a 12 week course that is, um, I guess also, uh, certified by the national strength and conditioning association. People can get, um, continuing education credits as strength and conditioners. And yeah, we, so we describe basically our philosophy, which I've kind of outlined a little bit in the podcast. And, you know, we, we go into a lot more of the nitty gritty and, um, and then we're really privileged to have, um, you know, t- more than 20 world experts that are embedded in various different sports around the world, e- explain how they use our philosophy to, to better their athletes performance. So yeah, the course you, you actually get with the course, you can pick either one sport, um, like, you know, you, you're listening to this, you might pick triathlon, or you can get the, the full, um, sport bundle where you get all 20 sports. Um, with the, the expert telling how they, um, they use hit to, um, to better their athletes sort of performance in the triathlon one, it's, uh, Dan Plews and myself, Plews and Prof. And, but I, again, I really recommend the sport bundle, um, because I think the swimming, uh, road cycling and both running lectures are, are just absolutely fantastic. Um, f- yeah, so for the elite coaches out there, it's going to be invaluable because, uh, and, and I've learned, I've learned so much, uh, as a triathlon coach from looking at what single sport experts go out and, and use, and I've been able to draw in those examples into my triathlon training. So, um, yeah, we can, can look can at I give one, one, one interesting example of uh, something you've learned from the single sport af- athletes or single sport coaches. Whoa, where would I, I mean, what do I choose? What do I choose? Um, I, I think the, um, you know, just even just, like actually just looking at some of the, um, the sessions that they use, like, I, I think, I think the majority of some of the sessions, even the ones that I sort of described here today in, in, uh, in the triathlon lectures, I've probably stolen a bunch of those ones from, from all of the other, other, other different lecturers. Um, you know, the right across the different swim sets that I might use to, um, the, the specific, uh, intervals and the long, the, the mid zone stuff that I learned from, from Mark Quad in the cycling lecture. And then the, um, the running, um, 
you know, the, the running lectures or I use a number of those different um, prescriptions in, in, um, in a lot of, you know, Kyle and, and other, other uh, athletes programming. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just inc- incredibly, I've, I've found it incredibly valuable. So we want to give that back to the, to the world through hit science. Yeah, I, I'm excited. And, and just uh, mention the date of the, the launch date again, bearing in mind that this podcast will go out on the 7th of January. Yeah, so we soft launch tomorrow, as I was mentioning to you. Tomorrow, um, so by the time of this recording, so we will be out. Of course, yeah. yeah, sorry. And then the book, the book's out, uh, same time. And then the hard launch date uh, is going to be the 12th of um, the 12th of January. So that's that's when it's going to be fully available for... Um, yeah, the, the full course is going to going to be available on the twelfth twelfth of January, and uh, yeah, there'll be a, a, the first enrollment will will be up until January thirty first, and then and I think you know, we're not exactly sure how we're going to go about it, but it might be on a sort of a quarterly semester basis um, for enrollment thereafter. So check it check it out if this is um, this is your thing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been uh, really great uh, talking to you as usual. And uh, I really hope that uh, that the listeners have learned a lot about HIT and consider uh, giving the book and uh, the course a look as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, mate. It's, it's, been, it's been super chatting to you. I hope that you enjoyed this episode. Uh, definitely, if you want to learn more, you are hooked on uh, this uh, knowledge about interval training that uh, Paul keeps bringing to us on the podcast. Go and order that book. If nothing else, to give back as thank you for all the work that Paul and Martin has done with Hit Science and uh, all the knowledge that they put out on their blog, on social media, and on podcasts like this. I've done it. Uh, I'm waiting for my pre order copy. And uh, as I said earlier, I can't wait to get my hands on it. Definitely also go back and re-listen to those previous interviews that I did with Paul in episode 128 and 29. And also I have two solo episodes that I did on intro training uh, called Designing Intro Training, 10 Things You Have to Know. And the second episode, Designing Intro Training, 10 More Things You Have to Know. Uh, And those are episode numbers 139 and 146. Everything will be linked up in the show notes and in the episode description. And for this particular episode, you can, as usual, find the show notes on thattriathlonshow.com. And if you have any questions or comments about this episode, uh, leave it on that show notes page. In the next episode, we will hear from Sarah McClarty on executing on race day. And Sarah is a former elite triathlete. You have probably seen her writing in Triathlete magazine. And she has been heavily involved in helping out with the USA Triathlon uh, elite squads when they travel to races all over the world. With her racing experience, she's uh, been an integral member of uh, the support staff around that now that her own racing days are over. Finally, some house cleaning items. Uh, first, as I mentioned on the first Q&A episode, the Ironman Intermediate 7.3 16-week training plan that uh, was made available on Training Peaks in November is now also available as a PDF version on my website. And for those of you who have purchased the Training Peaks plan, you can get the PDF version for free. You have received an email if you left an email when you purchased. And uh, in that case, just follow the instructions there. But if for some reason you did not receive that email, then just email me that you want the PDF version and email me your uh, your receipt from the Training Peaks transaction and I'll send the PDF version to you as well. And for those of you who are not using Training Peaks, this is now your chance to get uh, an excellent 70.3 plan uh, to achieve your 2019 race goals. And uh, you are not uh, bound to any platform. Just get that PDF and uh, use it however you want. I highly recommend that if you are not able to invest in a coach, then at least get a training plan. That's uh, the second best thing that uh, that you could do to make sure that you train with structure and have some accountability as well. And the other thing, the other house cleaning item that I also mentioned on Thursday's episode, but some of you may not have listened to that, so I want to mention it here as well. I've been selected uh, as uh, an HRV for training brand ambassador in 2019, so I just want to uh, send a shout out and say thank you to Marco and uh, Ale at HRV for training for uh, for selecting me to to this group of ambassadors, and you can check all of us out on the HRV for HRV for training website, of course. 
And uh, what this means is basically that uh, HRE for Training is uh, is an app and a tool. I also use the HRE for Training Pro platform. Uh, that is something that I get to use as uh, as a brand ambassador. So full disclosure there that uh, I uh, get to use it for free. Uh, but I really love HRV for Training as an app, whether you, you use the standard version or the pro version. Uh, all of those have real, real value. And uh, that's something that I get more and more of my coached athlete to uh, to start doing, to measure their HRV with HRV for Training, to be able to individualize the training and, and be even more efficient and purposeful with how you train. Finally, big thanks once again to our sponsor, Retool. You can learn more about the Retool bike fitting process at retool.com forward slash TTS. That's R-E-T-U-L dot com forward slash TTS. And there you can learn how to book a Retool bike fit at an authorized Retool center near you. I'll link to it in the show notes and the episode description. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.